BBOR Black Box Online Radio coming to you from West Virginia. Black Box Ned 88 on Instagram for the bonus podcast. And welcome to BBOR, the home of True Crime Talk Radio and your premier destination for unsolved mysteries, criminal psychology, and exploring the dark side of cyberspace. My name is Ned DeHaan, and I am your host as well as the creator of Astro Psych 400 here on YouTube, and regular contributor to the Zodiac Killer channel. And a great way to support these shows is just by listening to some more content. But you can also go over to Amazon.com and have a look at the book Killer on a White Horse, written by me, Ned Dahan. It is a novel, murder mystery, inspired by the Zodiac Manson connection, but it is indeed fictional. However, who doesn't love a good mystery? And there is always the Teespring page. Feel free to check out some of the merchandise. And remember, being weird is not a crime. Let the show begin. Okay, hello everybody. Today is Friday. Another Anything Goes Friday. Welcome to the show. Just a couple of quick announcements and reminders before we begin. The first is, once a day here on Black Box Online Radio, I've been posting an older episode as well as asking you guys a polling question. Lots of true crime discussions that are available here on BBO War. And one of them that I had posted, one of the older episodes actually, was from 2020 called Satanic Movements in California. And I listened back to it, and I really thought this is one that needed a repeater a recreation. So what you're going to be hearing is a reiteration of the episode Satanic Movements in California. And of course, I invite you to listen to the original at the end. But I really thought that it could use a little bit more organization. And from time to time, I do this for the Anything Goes Friday segment, as well as for bonus episodes that come out on the weekend. And if you want to follow along with all of these true crime discussions, you can hit the like button, subscribe. It really helps out the channel. Also, feel free to visit some of the polling questions that are put out daily here on BBO War. And a great way to support all of these efforts is to go over to buymeacoffee.com. Buymeacoffee.com allows you to make a donation or contribution to help support the show, and anybody who makes a donation will get a shout-out on Zodiac Monday. With this episode, I would like to begin with the Zodiac Killer, because the Zodiac Killer is an unsolved serial killer mystery from the 1960s, and the satanic angle is one that is loosely explored, but not so deeply explored. And I went back and I found the episode that Geraldo Rivera had made called Maniac and the Mask, and they were talking about a possible Zodiac Killer satanic connection, and that episode actually featured the journalist Maury Terry, who is perhaps more famous for his coverage of the Son of Sam mystery as well as the Charles. Manson case, what they were talking about is, could the Zodiac Killer have been inspired by the Satanist and occultist Aleister Crowley? On September 27th of 1969, the Zodiac Killer committed the Lake Berryessa stabbing, and he was wearing a black costume that had a type of dicky flap that went down over the chest that had a circle with a cross going through it, and what they proposed in that episode, and a lot of this was shared by Maury Terry, was that that cross is actually a satanic symbol that Aleister Crowley promoted because it would allow somebody to be invisible to their enemies, and that was the reason why that this costume costume was created. It's all done as part of a twisted satanic ritual. And Maury Terry would expand upon this with um, really the stuff he's more famous for, his book The Ultimate Evil, which talked about a possible link between David Berkowitz and the Son of Sam shootings in New York and the activities of the Manson family in Southern California. And that is the idea that there was this group called the Process Church. And the Process Church, I mean, group isn't even a fair term. It's almost like a movement. And the Process Church of the Final Judgment. And there are these little cells of the Process Church that splinter off. One of them was the 22 Disciples of Hell, and David Berkowitz talked very frequently about Satan. He almost he talked very frequently about being Satanic when he was committing the Son of Sam shootings. Now he is, of course, um, converted to Christianity. But then there are these other cells that have splintered off called the Children, which are just this part of this nationwide, more or less, cult that is spreading Satanic activity and infiltrating 
these different sectors of the country, and one of them theoretically could have been the Manson family, and that was the motivation for the Tate LaBianca murders. Charles Manson even called the murder of Sharon Tate the altar in one of his interviews. That's actually in the Ronald Reagan Jr. interview. So there, these types of satanic influences can be observed and documented, but I really want to in also include the term Luciferian in this episode, satanic and Luciferian. I was just listening to the Vanish podcast, Vanish um, season 3, Episode 5, which featured Ross Rossi of Planet X Filmworks, and he was talking about how in 1966, we go beyond Aleister Crowley and we see the rise of Anton LaVey and the Church of Satan, but when, it, when they use the term satanic, what Ross was saying is that it's not about the actual worship of Satan, it's about the worship of oneself, it's about the worship of the self, and I think that that is a pretty good characterization of it, but what I've heard in the past from watching documentaries on uh, satanic practices on the Church of Satan is they've also said that it's about recognizing that mankind is the beast. It's about recognizing that the nature of man is a destroyer, the destructive tendencies of humanity, and it's about worshipping those tendencies. But the same people who were saying those in the documentary that I was watching years ago frequently said things about being pro-Satan. They would say Almighty Satan, Hail Satan. They are talking about Satan, but they're talking about the beast-like tendencies within humanity. With the term Luciferian, there is a slightly different belief, and that relates back to a story from Genesis, where there is this belief that Jesus and Lucifer are one and the same, and even even the snake in the Garden of Eden, the snake that is tempting Eve, that is Jesus, Lucifer, and actually the serpent. I mean, it's all it's all of those things in one. And the reason why Jesus and Lucifer are believed to be one and the same is that you have to liberate humanity by destroying it. This becomes a very practical belief system for the global elites, or people who are in positions of power. And William Cooper, author of Behold a Pale Horse, talked about this very frequently. So you have the satanic side and the Luciferian side. And what um, William Cooper wanted to point out was that the global elites will use this type of practice because it allows them to stay in power. Why not just drop a nuclear bomb on the country if you wanted to destroy humanity? Because then they wouldn't have the power structure anymore. What they need to do is to have uh, this type of illusion, the illusion of freedom. And I've heard Alex Jones, the conspiracy theorist, talk about this so frequently, but he never actually said that in these exact words. I had to read it from somebody in the comments comment section when they were talking about to maintain power, the illusion of freedom has to be maintained as well. And that's just what somebody wrote out, and I think that that is so true, and that's relevant to this type of Luciferian practice. Okay, though, so how does that relate to any type of satanic movement or satanic operation? Number one, let's look at the Black Dahlia, another story from Southern California, the Black Dahlia murder, the murder of Elizabeth Short, and... Now, this is an unsolved case, but one of the prime suspects in the Black Dahlia murder is George Hodel. He was the doctor to the Hollywood elites. He was in charge of a venereal disease unit in California. I don't know this 100%, but I believe that George Hodel was indeed the Black Dahlia Avenger. So does his son, Steve Hodel, who has written extensively about it. And in the uh, 1930s and 40s, there is this movement... To surrealist art, because the surrealist art connection is going to be influenced by Salvador Dali. Salvador Dali is perhaps the most famous surrealist artist, and I want to be very clear about something. Everything that I say in this episode is not going to be directly um, connected to Salvador Dali. I'm not putting any label on Salvador Dali. No, none of the comments are directly and personally related to him. But people are then using surrealist art as a way to um, justify their destructive tendencies. And one possibility could be the Black Dahlia murder. Elizabeth Short was bisected, her body was cut in half through the second and third lumbar vertebrae, her face was also mutilated, and the theory is that George Hodel committed that crime is a very bizarre form of surrealist art, because he didn't just want to be in charge of the STDs and STIs of the Hollywood elites. I mean, he's making all these types of connections, he's very involved in the elite circles, and then he didn't want that to be his life. He wanted to actually do something to just go above and beyond. And the whole concept of surrealist art, blending the states of being and so on. But that is the foundation. Then when you get to the Zodiac Killer of the 1960s, you have... The concept of Dali Day, going back to Salvador Dali, and I have to give a lot of credit to Playtime, who shared this stuff with me, and Playtime was perhaps the person who provided the most information 
for me in regards to the CIA and Dolly Day. Okay, so you have a possible Zodiac killer, occult, satanic connection, but then you have a more of um, a CIA connection, and that is that this it's the same Luciferian concept, but it is that there are these things called Dolly Days. We have a 12-month calendar of some months have 30 days, some have 31, and February has 28. But if you were to arrange the months in a 13-month calendar along the lunar cycles, it's called the 13-moon calendar, then you would arrange the days in rows of four and columns of seven. And so there are 28 days in each month. And the first column would be the Dolly days. And on these days, the CIA commits crimes, and then they blame it on the occult. And all of the dates of Zodiac activity line up on Dolly days. If you were to arrange this out in the 13-month calendar, this is true. I mean, I'll put the images up on the screen. And the first Zodiac crime was on December 20th of 1968. The second one was on June, July 4th of 1969. The third was on September 27th of 1969. And the fourth one was on October 11th of 1969. So all of these um, crimes took places on Dolly Day. So this is something that the CIA does, and then they try to blame it off on some type of occult practice. But really, it's just the Luciferian element of the CIA is trying to do the bidding of the global elites. Because the CIA is the private arm of the global elites. They are not a government entity. They're trying to preserve the existing power structure. And a lot of this is very theoretical, and I'm sure you've heard this on Infowars before. And, I mean, we do have to emphasize that. These are theories that people have as to why these crimes have been committed, the Black Dahlia murder, the Zodiac crimes. But it goes well beyond that, because we also have a crime that is mostly solved to most people's satisfaction, the Tate-LaBianca murders. Let's get away from this type of um, government conspiracy CIA angle and look at some of the secrets of the Hollywood elites. Now, this is a theory that I think most people have thought about at some point in regards to the Tate-LaBianca murders. Tate comes from the name Sharon Tate. She was an actress. She was the wife of Roman Polanski, the movie director, and she was pregnant at the time. Previously, Roman Polanski had made a film called Rosemary's Baby, and I'm not going to give away any spoilers, but that film is filled with satanic imagery, and there's lots of Hail Satan in there. And one of the victims in the LaBianca murders was named Rosemary. Lino and Rosemary LaBianca were the two victims on the second night of the Manson family's um, rampage of carnage, if we want to call it that. Okay, so one of the victims, uh, the wife of Roman Polanski, is murdered, and also her unborn baby is murdered, his unborn baby is murdered. The next night, of one of the victims is named Rosemary. Some people believe that the Tate LaBianca murders occurred because they wanted to punish Roman Polanski for revealing too many secrets of the satanic practices involving the Hollywood elites and the California elites in the film Rosemary's Baby. So they retaliated. They murdered his baby, and they murdered a woman named Rosemary to leave a signature. And this is something that has heavily, heavily connected to the concept of the global elites. They hide in plain sight. It goes back to Edgar Allan Poe and the Purloin letter, hiding in plain sight, because, again, it allows the illusion of freedom to be maintained. People are not going to be questioning things because they, they it just becomes so so obvious that that it's just it's right there in front of them but they're just going to try and deceive people or nobody's going to look at something that's right there in front of them they think that the secret must be lurking in the shadows but it's actually in the daylight and i think that um again you you have to accept that these are observations that people have made these are theories that people have made and you cannot bring them into a court of law but you examine the thought process that other people are sharing. There is another California event that I would like to talk about, and that is Bohemian Grove. I have at least one episode about Bohemian Grove directly on this channel, and even on YouTube, I was listening to somebody who was a staffer at Bohemian Grove, and yes, staffer, because Bohemian Grove is a retreat that involves a lot of the um, world elites and officials. Some of them are political leaders, some of them are media elites, and they get together and they perform their own types of rituals. The most famous is called the Cremation of Care, which I don't believe is a directly satanic or luciferian ritual. I believe it's a Canaanite ritual, but it was recorded by Alex Jones and shared um, in one of his earlier documentaries. That's one of the things that actually propelled him from just being this uh, small-time uh, conspiracy reporter to being a little bit larger and definitely larger on the filmmaking circuit. 
But with the cremation of care, there, there, and the uh, Bohemian Grove practices, there was this interview with a staffer because he said that, okay, these people are global elites. These are rich people. These are powerful people. They don't do things like providing themselves with their own food. I mean, they're, Bohemian Grove has catering. They have like support systems they have staff who does things who don't who do things with like the leisure activities associated with bohemian grove and he said that more or less it isn't so much about satanic practices but what people don't realize about bohemian grove is that it's all about prostitution and what he said something that was so unbelievably true says no matter who they are no matter what level they are in society when people are behind closed doors, they will do the same things. They will all do the same things. They will drink alcohol, they will do drugs, and they will have sex. And, I mean, I can completely follow what he's saying. He's just saying Bohemian Grove is filled with prostitutes from all different backgrounds, male and female prostitutes, their escorts that are brought in for these Bohemian Grove retreats. And you can think about it in relation to something like the... Holly weird parties that we've been talking about involving George Hill Hotel and how he's interacting with these surrealist art parties and communities for the California elites. It's the same practice. They're just trying to find some justification for it. That there are they are doing drugs, they are having sex, and they are drinking large amounts of alcohol, and they're trying to find some type of facade or masquerade that they can use to um, put just a little bit more of an acceptable uh, face on the subject, but in reality they're committing very um, very self-serving actions behind closed doors, and outside they are creating this image uh, that is deceiving the general public, but in reality a lot of the activities and the decisions of people are very destructive. I mean, look at the carnage of all the examples that we've mentioned. The Tate LaBianca murders, the Zodiac killer, the Black Dahlia murder, there definitely are times when the activities of these um, secret groups or these secret entities spill over into society, and then people are forced to deal with the brunt of the consequences. But here is something, though, that we need to provide. That we also need to provide a certain sense of counterbalance. As previously stated, these are theoretical claims that are not necessarily proven. I mean, the claim about uh, Roman Polanski and the Tate LaBianca murders, that is just people um, connecting certain types of wordplay together. Anything's possible. I mean... Anything is possible, and I do approach this stuff with an open mind, but that is not a certifiable conclusion. As far as the Zodiac Killer's operations go, many people think a lot to the contrary, and they believe that the Zodiac Killer was mostly just a lone nut or a sad, lonely man who was uh, trying to commit crimes in a very bizarre way because he didn't want to get caught. Sometimes he, well, one time he wore the costume, the hooded costume, another time he murdered a taxi driver and stole a piece of his shirt. He's just doing things in an unpredictable way because he doesn't want to be captured. And as far as the Black Dahlia murder, even though I said that I do think that George Hodel should be the prime suspect in the Black Dahlia case, he, he was never convicted of it, and also there are other suspects that people propose, and there are other theories that people have as to who um, committed the murder of Elizabeth Short. But overall, though, I'm really curious, what do you guys think about any of these types of observations involving satanic practices and Luciferian practices? And another um, aspect of these types of discussions that needs to be included is that Alistair Crowley and Anton LaVey were very influential on the mindset that we have about the satanic underworld. I mean, they're very influential on the public concept of Satanism, satanic practices, satanic rituals, but I would like to uh, cite the YouTuber Logan Albright, who wanted to share something very, very clearly about these individuals, and that is that Aleister Crowley's primary function was that he wanted to be a literary great. He wanted to be a famous writer and be well-respected for his writing. However, he really just wasn't in at that level, and he really tried hard by creating some compositions such as the drug. But what allowed him to propel himself into this higher echelon of recognized individuals was these satanic ideologies, or these um, being referred to as an occultist, so to speak. And the exact same thing is true with Anton LaVey, except what is said about him, I never knew the guy personally, but what they say about him is that he actually wanted to be a famous musician, and he wanted to be respected for his music, but he just 
just wasn't at the level of being a professional and well-respected musician. So what's the turn again? Going back to, um, well, the same thing as Aleister Crowley, using these satanic practices to propel himself into the upper echelon. But with the satanic um, I issues in the 1960s, 1966, the Church of Satan, something that needs to be reiterated and reemphasized is that not everybody was pro-hippie in the 1960s. You have all of this counterculture stuff. You have all of the hippies going around promoting peace, love, and joy, and some people view them as absolute hypocrites. They thought that these people are liars, they are frauds, they're talking about peace, love, and joy, but all they're doing is just bathing in their own material selfishness. This isn't peace, love, and joy, this is just self-optimization. So what's the counterculture to the counterculture? The Church of Satan, where people think that this whole worship of self and recognizing man as the beast is a more viable option, it's a more honest option, and it's also just something that is in complete contradiction to flower power and the summer of love and all of these things. And there also, there also is a very important point that needs to be uh, reiterated as well. Not all people who are opposed to the hippie movement would adopt these concepts of the Church of Satan. What some people would do is they would become slippies. This term is used with the Manson family as well. They are called slippies because they would slip under the cover of being a hippie, but in reality, they were not part of the movement. And Lynetta Squeaky Fromey even talked about this in an interview when she was promoting her book Reflection, and that is that... They didn't have to identify as hippies because the people were just expressing themselves and they were just following along with certain trends. And just because people were living a certain way, it does not mean that they completely subscribe to an identity or to an ideology or they had these types of labels on them. Just because people had a particular way that, of dressing or a particular style of music that they were listening to, it does not mean that they adopted any greater identity other than that. They were just people living their lives, and some people call them hippies and some people call them slippies, but in the minds of a lot of people from the 1960s, so said Squeaky, she uh, seems like a balanced, level-headed person, she said that they were just being their ordinary selves, but also we should remember that there are people then who are just from the older generations who were opposed to the hippies, they hated the hippies, for the same reason as the Church of Satan. It's just they would adopt more conservative lifestyles. This is even explored in the film The Trial of the Chicago Seven, when he's talking, um, the, there's a character, Abby Hoffman, played by Sasha Baron Cohen. Yes, Abby Hoffman was a real person. And he uh, t says that inside the bar there are the, there is the 1950s, outside of the bar there is the 1960s. And talking about how people are moving in this type of um, counterculture direction. Yes, of course, um, Abby Hoffman was even involved with the attempted poisoning of the president, which was mostly a joke. I mean, I have one episode about that here on this channel called The Crimes of Grace Slick. And um, if you would like to listen through some more things here on Black Box Online Radio, uh, I would invite you to hit the like button and subscribe once again. Also, please feel free to visit some of the links in the description box, including the link for the book Killer on a White Horse, and there will be a sequel to Killer on a White Horse coming out very soon, sometime this year at the time of this recording. If you're listening to this in the future, feel free to check that out. But what do you think about this whole dynamic of the satanic movements in California in relation to these case examples, the Zodiac Killer, the Manson Family, the Black Dahlia Murder, and of course the uh, nationwide movement involving the Process Church, the Children, the 22 uh, Disciples of Hell. What do you think about that? Do you think that people are misrepresenting the situation? Because the thing that Maury Terry, the guy I was talking about at the beginning, gets accused of is he gets accused of intentionally misrepresenting the situation, blowing it out of proportion, and very simply not being accurate. With the claims involving the Zodiac Killer CIA connection or the Zodiac Killer Satanic connection, they get accused of simply just providing a theory and an unsolved murder mystery that's just as good as anybody else's theory, or even, even lower on the totem pole of theories because it is relying a lot on certain types of mental gymnastics, and I want to know what you guys think about that. And also, what do you think about the uh, Manson family being involved with any type of Satanic connection? And if you have any comments about Aleister Crowley or Anton LaVey, I would love to read them down below. And this whole concept of how the Church of Satan was the antidote for some people to the 1960s and this whole image of flower power, which they viewed to be just uh, somewhat fraudulent, or they viewed it as a dishonest movement, so they would turn to things like the Church of Satan. Please share your ideas in the comment section down below. I would love to know what you guys think. Anybody can write the show at Blackbox Online Radio at AOL.com. You can also get me on Facebook. My personal Facebook is in the description box. And there is always BlackboxNid88 over on Instagram. And I will see you there for the bonus podcast. Until next time.